harm from smoking is still open to debate, and the company promises to present more of what it calls socially responsible ads in the future. Here to talk about the images and realities of the tobacco industry and smoking, we welcome Alan Blum, MD. He's a family physician and editor of the New York State Journal of Medicine. Well, Dr. Blum, ever since the Attorney General many years ago said that smoking could be injurious to our health, are there any new facts in, scientific facts, about smoking and health? Mary Helen, I don't think that there's uh, anyone over the age of two that hasn't heard uh, the Surgeon General's warning that uh, smoking is hazardous to your health. The problem is that we now have uh, one company of an industry that uh, is basically trying to get people to have doubt. And that's their whole weapon. Uh, it couldn't be as bad as all that. Everything causes cancer. You know, uh, saccharin causes cancer, asbestos causes cancer, uh, angel dust uh, makes you forget all about cancer, I guess. But the, the, the whole point is that cancer is with us and that's a fearful topic. It's a devastating disease. Emphysema you never hear about very much. This is the disease where your air sacs just explode. You're, you're, you're literally uh, suffocating your lungs with that. But you don't see people with emphysema walking around because they're up in their apartments or in their uh, houses, uh, literally dying very slowly and having to breathe uh, from oxygen tanks. There are people who have emphysema, though, who don't smoke. Well, uh, I don't know of any physician, and, and uh, myself uh, have never seen, in 10 years uh, out of medical school, have never seen a patient with emphysema who did not smoke. Are there any areas of dispute within the scientific community? Well, because the, the irony is, you go into a hospital, there are a lot of doctors who are still smoking. I think that physicians are just as big of victims as uh, the rest of us. Uh, well, I mean, I'm a physician, so I guess I'm, I'm a victim as well. I feel that an advertisement for cigarettes, knowing what we know, makes a mockery of medicine, makes a mockery of everything that we've done over the last 40 years. You know, it hasn't been recent evidence that's shown the Surgeon General that this is the leading preventable cause of death and disease in our society. It's 35 to 40 years of concrete evidence. And uh, I think that people don't want to accept these things, particularly when you've got an industry that profits off this product. This is the most profitable item in our society. I don't know whether people have ever looked at cigarettes as a consumer item. Uh, you know, people tell me, uh, but Doc, I smoke a low tar cigarette. And I say, well, well what's tar? Well, uh, you know, that's uh, bad stuff. Well, so in other words, you're going to get less of it. But tar is cancer-causing agents. That's what's included. Would you buy a can of soup that was lowest in carcinogens? Would you go out and buy a loaf of bread that was, uh, yes, I'd, I'd like the one with only two milligrams of poison, please. <laughs> you know, that's the game that they've been playing, and it's consumer education in reverse. Well, now, we've interviewed uh, members of the tobacco industry. As in fact, we, we invited some on today, but they would not come on. Uh, one of the things that they've pointed out is studies where prisoners, for example, have been smoking widely and did not show the same uh, disease results as did the general population. And they point to the possibility that stress-related factors combined with the smoking may be causing the, the disease and not so much the cigarettes themselves. Well, they also say that, uh, that advertising doesn't influence anyone to smoke, and it's only peer pressure. But could you respond to the particular Well, I guess what, what I'm sort of saying is that, you know, you've got to decide at some point whether you're going to believe a physician or not, or whether you're going to believe someone who's paid uh, as a public relations person who's not licensed to practice medicine to uh, say what they have to say to derive a profit. I, I feel mm -hmm. that the, the selling of cigarettes today in, in 1984, an appropriate enough year, where you have the Marlboro Man right around the corner, you have Marlboro billboards on pole position, which is a video arcade game going to children. When you have this type of thing going on, when 350,000 people are being killed every year by this product, more than all we lost in World War II, then I think we're dealing with a, a, a situation that can't be debated any longer. This is a cold, as cold a, a fact as you can find in medicine, that cigarette smoking is the major, if not the only major cause in our society of lung cancer, of emphysema, and of heart attack. Now, only one out of seven people even realizes that, that, that cigarette smoking is directly related to one of the three major risk factors for heart attack. Well, Dr. Blum, the first advertisements for cigarettes were promoted as mild and sweet, according to That's you. That's right. Well, you know, if you go back, cigarette smoking is not an age-old tradition. It's less than 100 years old. And, in fact, we're in the 100th anniversary of the cigarette-making machine. And here was an old ad that, that had the, uh, the Cheryl Teagues of, our, uh, of, of that time uh, was on the front cover of this postcard saying, Welcome, mild and sweet. And how were they sold, especially on account of the low percentage of nicotine? So they were always concerned about health. 
But it wasn't until the 1920s that a fellow named Albert Lasker thought of the campaign that to keep a slender figure, no one could deny, reach for lucky instead of a sweet. And he even got doctors saying, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. <laughs> research. You know, they've used words like research and science. And all their research was was marketing research, going to doctors and saying, would you put these out in your ashtrays? Do you inhale? This was a, a kind of advertisement. They, they even said that, that seven out of ten smokers didn't even know that they were inhaling. Now they're going to legislatures all over the country saying that uh, people, uh, they're trying to start segregation all over again, trying to segregate our society. And uh, they, they're claiming that there's no effect to the non-smoker, no effect to the fetus, in spite of what we've known about the effect on, uh, on uh, uh, stillborn infants and so forth due to smoking. And then they're saying they're not going after children. Here's an example of an Eric Clapton jacket for R.J. Reynolds' Camel brand. Now, this is the company, R.J. Reynolds, that's taking out these ads, saying that they don't have any interest in going after children. And the, the, the industry itself is taking out a questionnaire ads and, and, and asking, uh, does cigarette advertising uh, affect uh, children and so forth? And of course it does. Uh, they're not going to plunk down a billion and a half dollars a year. Uh, to sell the, the leading preventable cause of death in our society if it doesn't sell the product. It, if it doesn't influence people to start smoking, then they could save themselves a lot of money by not uh, advertising this product. But the whole myth that brand imagery and brand names is the only purpose of advertising is that you to change your brand. Can you think of any other product where there are only five or six manufacturers and uh, where if they're only trying to get you to change their brand, you'd think that they'd only each make one and thus uh, reduce the number of choices. Uh, this way they're creating this illusion that there really are a number of choices for consumers. The other night I happened to see um, an old Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall movie. Or did you want to comment? Oh, well, you know, speaking of movie stars, you know, here's the, this is the image that we spoof with a group called Doc, or Doctors Ought to Care. This is a group that was founded to, to, to just take a look at the macho image. You know that fellow that, that used to say, I smoke for, for taste, and so we just posed the cigarette dangling out of a different orifice with a, a little bit different message with, I smoke for smell, and uh, we sponsored an emphysema slims tennis tournament, you know, that's going to be in the city uh, in the next week or so, uh, where these poor uh, ladies are going to be uh, playing tennis for a cigarette company. We've taken out advertising, um, well, this, is, this really tells it like it is, that you don't see in the cigarette ads, a 10-year supply, only $7,000. Uh, we once had a call, you forgot the warning, you know, they, they complained that they, we didn't put the little, they thought that was a real cigarette ad, you know. And then we went in front of uh, various uh, hospitals and other groups and we had uh, a new brand, Country Fresh Arsenic, uh, that was another one that we, this was the first paid counter advertisement. Uh, to discourage kids from taking up cigarettes. And they didn't like that. The cigarette industry didn't like this. Uh, this is another one of our ads. Uh, we've got some TV commercials, a young lady coming down a country lane saying, sure, I used to smoke. Doesn't every kid? But then my boyfriend told me I had zoo breath, and, and that was enough for me. I taste better without cigarettes, she says. I think that that's really the wave of the future. You don't see too many people <laughs> up there on billboards next to the macho Marlboro loser, really telling it like it is and laughing at these pushers of drugs. And that's really what it is. But in my era, the, the, the cigarette companies didn't need to advertise. Every movie, and I started to say, that I saw to have and have no, which is 40 years old, every scene someone was smoking and it was made to be very glamorous. Right, and you know how they had to do and that. And that really influenced Well, they my had generation. to say that smoking was a social success. The, the, no woman, no self respecting woman would smoke before the 1930s. And so they had to come up with this healthful thing that would keep you slender. And today we have Virginia, what we call emphysema slims. I think the whole point is that, that the smoking does not make you thin. Otherwise, the, so many fat people you wouldn't would be, be smoking. <laughs> I, well, you know, I, I think it's, it's really a myth that smoking relieves anxiety. It doesn't. It reinforces anxiety uh, by not having had it. That's part of a dependence process. I have never met a patient or anyone else who smokes who has ever said it means a whole deal in their lives. It means something to somebody. It means a whole lot to the cigarette industry. But now, Doctor, you're, I applaud what you're trying to do. How do you help those poor addicts? Basically, I just have them laugh at themselves. Cigarettes are something that we've been lectured about too long. We shouldn't be telling people about diseases. We should be telling them how they're being ripped off as a consumer. What are you plunking down a dollar and a quarter for? You're paying for artificial tobacco substitutes with chemicals, with materials in there designed. And this is what is going on right now in Congress and in the New York State Legislature with the Cigarette Fire Safety Act, designed to burn in a 50 mile an hour wind. They are adding known chemicals that will continue to burn in spite of the fact, let's say, a pipe or a cigar will burn out. 
This is an industry, you don't see a list of ingredients on the label. They will not tell anyone what they put in these. It is the only unregulated product in our society. Our society, anyone who studied triangular trade and the history of this nation knows that tobacco was an important part of it. It's not just a consumer item, it's, it's part of our history. Are you interested in having it eliminated as a product or just to have consumers terribly informed? Well, tobacco has been with us for thousands of years and until the last 100 years, we never saw the great deal of difficulties we're seeing now. In fact, Alton Oxner, who was a doctor in the 1940s and 50s, who was the first to call the alert on smoking and lung cancer, was told when he was a medical student in 1919, he'd never see another case again. This was so rare. We have something unlike any other variable that has come out in the last 100 years. It is primarily the cigarette. And people say, well, there's diesel engines. The fact is, the incidence of lung cancer in rural Iowa is the same as in New York City, where supposedly the tobacco industry claims the air is so bad. All I'm saying is, let's put things in proportion. Let's not uh, create everything being an equal carcinogen, EDB, you know, removing about, muffin mix while we still have cigarettes on the shelves. How about an answer to the question, though? Are you in favor of eliminating the product or just having consumers informed? I think the, the second answer is always the better one. My feeling is railroads were once a major part of our society, too. We had to give way to the jet engine, which has done so much mm -hmm. to advance uh, transportation. I think similarly, the cigarette is a dead issue. Cigarettes do nothing other than cause yellow teeth, cause fires, cause kids to be misled into thinking that they have to be a tennis player to place to, to you know, and a smoker and place tennis. The kind of deception that they're doing, not only should they be uh, called upon to end their advertising, uh, but if they don't, they should be put on trial. I think this is a legal issue where they are deceiving children into believing that cigarettes are still the kind of macho and feminist issue that is, is totally a lie. They're, they're, they're selling children a pack of lies. Do you think there should be segregation in restaurants between well, smokers and non-smokers? You know, again, the, 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 the freedom of choice issue, I, I think uh, an airplane's without any question. You're dealing with a tinderbox. I was at the Civil Aeronautics Board hearings recently testifying in favor of, of getting rid of smoking on airplanes because of the fact you're dealing with, with an absolute powder keg up there. You've got kerosene flames, and the only thing Congress has done is to say, okay, we'll make the seats more fireproof. You have nowhere to go. You can't walk out for a breath of fresh air. You can't escape on a fire letter when you're up. And there have been 75, according to the testimony, over 75 fires a year that are not reported in the mass media, and my feeling, because of the enormous amount of cigarette advertising, that are caused by cigarette-related uh, fires. In airplanes. In airplanes. This is not getting out, because the influence of the cigarette industry over your mass media today, I think, is even greater than ever. How so? There's no cigarette advertising on television? No, not per se, but the Miller Beer is about your leading advertiser. That's Philip Morris, uh, a New York corporation that is the main product of advertiser of Marlboro. We've created some commercials, though, by the way, and I, I just was hoping we'd be able to show one of our, our, our spoof commercials that... Uh, well, it will be shown oh, towards the end of the program. Good. But, good uh, I, I, but just continue. What has happened to you since you've become so outspoken against cigarettes? What kinds of problems have you come up against or areas where... Uh, people have not agreed with you. Well, when I was editor of the Medical Journal of Australia, we did a, an article entitled A Tracheostomy. Uh, that's a little hole you have to... A Tracheostomy for the Marlboro Man. And uh, Philip Morris attempted to uh, suggest that we couldn't say the words Marlboro. That was a trademark, as if you can't say Coca-Cola or you can't say another brand. The fact is that they do not want any criticism. And you don't, on a day-to-day -day basis, see any counter-advertising. The reason why counter-ads are no longer on television was not, you remember the fellow from Perry Mason that used to say, I, I, I used to play the loser and the district attorney, now I am the loser, I've got lung cancer. Well, those ads were so effective that they reduced the consumption of cigarettes by upwards of 30% in three years between 1967 and 1970, even though the cigarette ads were still on the air. And they used to put them on at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. The fact is, that's what we're trying to get back on the air now, the counter ads, and we're trying to pay for them. So tell us about DOC, D-O-C. Well, DOC is a, an offbeat group of, of physicians, by and large, that goes to communities and aids them in trying to discourage uh, teenage uh, drug abuse. And it stands for doctors? Doctors ought to care. Mm -hmm. And we started out with three family physicians in 1977, and net we're now over uh, 1,000 strong. And uh, we've had a lot of fun, again, sponsoring Embassy Muslims tennis tournaments and looking at uh, various ways in which alcohol and marijuana and other forms of drug abuse are really hurting children. Did you ever smoke? 
Well, I, mm -hmm. I used to say to my patients that asked me the same question, yeah, I, I was a late smoker. I started at 13. Uh, most kids today start at uh, 10 and 11, and, and, and that's the problem. I, I quickly gave it up because I saw you don't need it. I saw that I would rather use my money to go to uh, sporting events, to, to uh, buy uh, records or books, and, and to save for the rainy day. Unfortunately, disposable income from people that can't afford it, that can least afford it, is going to cigarettes. What do you say to people who say, I don't know what to do with my hands, Doc? Well, you know, uh, nothing wrong with talking about sex on the air. I know you do programs on sex <laughs> therapy. I think that, seriously, uh, you know, getting to know people, holding their hands is a lot more fun than, than having to hold a cigarette. But a answer me this. I mean, would you, would you go after having spent all day at, at the beauty parlor, not that you need to, but, but at $400 for a gown and nice shoes and so forth, and go to a party and hold up five cents, that's all it is, five cents worth of, of yellowing stinkweed. And yet that in, in the commercials is created as a, it, it's beige, it's new, it's more, that's the brand name, it's more, it's beige. I mean, people are not <laughs> smoking because they don't know it's bad. Well, they're smoking I'll... because they're being suckered into believing this is fashionable. Well, this is ridiculous. And this is a yellower of teeth. It's a grunge breath thing, you know, it's, it's just, it's a losing proposition. Thank you. Alan Blum, M.D. He's a family physician and editor of the New York State Journal of Medicine.